teachers, dear community, dear friends. I don't know about you, but I feel pretty uh, relaxed and peaceful right now after the walk and after the beautiful videos. Uh, maybe we had enough? Are we peaceful enough yet? Happy enough? We'll, we'll do our best to continue to share from our own experience of the practice of mindfulness and the practice of peace and happiness. Like our teacher shares so beautifully that don't look for it in the future, but come back and touch it in this moment. So when we practice mindfulness, it's helping us to be aware of what is going on in the present moment. So when we train ourselves to come back to our breathing and our footsteps, we become more aware of what's going on in the present moment. We become more aware of our bodies, but also our feelings, what's going on in our mind, but also the world around us. How's my life going? How's my relationships doing? Do I feel uh, like I'm in the flow of things in my life? But we become aware of what is going on inside of us and around us. And when we become aware, we also have the opportunity to become aware of all the wonders of life. So there's a possibility for us to live our lives happily and peacefully. So. Today I was asked to share a little bit about the five mindfulness trainings, which is a clear training to reduce, do that, to live a happy and peaceful life in the present moment. Sometimes we think about the future. If this will happen, if I graduate and I get together with this person, or I get this kind of job, then I'll be happy, I'll be content. And we might think about the past and think, like, wow, those are really happy times. That was wonderful. That was like, that was the good old days. Even for young ones, we can do like that. But sometimes when we're thinking about the past or the future, we're dreaming about it and we're kind of getting burdened by it. We're losing ourselves in the future, in speculations and ideas about the future, or we're reminiscing about the past and burying ourselves in what could have been in the past. So when we train ourselves to come back to the present moment, we recognize also that actually our future is made up of the present moment. And our present moment is made up by our past. So the five mindfulness training is a, a clear way to look at our lives and our, how we interact with life. We talk about three kinds of actions, how we interact in our life. It's our thinking. You can include like our emotional, our feeling life, our thinking, our mental activity, our words, what we speak out, and our physical actions. So those are like when we come back to the present moment, and we look deeply into the moment, what is going on? When we're not so preoccupied, what happens when I die? Or what about if I would have gone to that school? And we let go of that and we come back to the present moment and we recognize, yeah, all the time we're producing these three actions. And we say that these three actions will make up our future. The way we think and feel today, the way we speak today, and the way we act today is leading into the next moment, right? very naturally. So the five mindfulness trainings is a kind of a support from many generations of, of people and is a, we call it a Buddhist contribution to a global ethic. But also recognizing and knowing that in all major spiritual tradition there's elements of this. So the experience of how to live a fulfilled, a happy and peaceful life is there in our ancestry. So we can see them as a mirror to look at ourselves and look at our actions. So when we become more aware of our present moment and our thinking, we're also seeing what are the consequences of those thoughts, what are the consequences of our words and our actions. So we're seeing that they have a consequence and what we're interacting. Already when we're saying a kind word, we already feel like open and happy. If we feel really irritated and we we yell at someone, we're also already experiencing that irritation, right? And it continues to 
maybe make the relationship with that person difficult. So the five mindfulness trainings is like a mirror. So it's like a direction and also to see ourselves more clearly. So it's not like a, a doctrine or a set of rules that we have to abide by and if not, we're in trouble. But we help us to look at our lives and how we interact with life and where we want to go in our life. So when we come back to the present moment and look into and reflect about the future, what is really important for me? A couple of days ago we had a, a sharing at the uh, University of Oregon in Eugene and a, a friend was sharing that he goes to school there as a part of the wake up movement there. And he was sharing, like reflecting on what do I care about? What's most important for me? What do I care about? So that is the kind of like reflection we can have also through the five mindfulness trainings into our daily lives. So the first mindfulness training is called Reverence for Life and is pertaining to killing or refraining from killing in many different ways, but also to nurture our compassion so that we don't just see like, okay, we're not going to do that, but we also want to cultivate the antidote, the beautiful quality that is like the flip side of the violence, the aggression, the killing, the, the compassion, the kindness, and also not just for ourselves, but how can we help others engage in less killing? How can we help others open up their heart in compassion and seeing the beauty of life? We're very fortunate here this evening. We have a little one yet to be born. Right? We have another little one already born, but very young. So when we see youngsters like this and we, we see life as it's being birthed, we have a lot of appreciation and reverence for life. And for this human existence, it's such a beautiful thing. We can all touch that awe, oh, like wow. But somewhere along the line we forget. We become too busy and preoccupied and we're not aware of the present moment and the wonder of still being alive on this beautiful planet. So reverence for life is also to come back to seeing the beauty and the wonders in life. So we want to protect it, and not just human life, but plant life and animal life, and the planetary life. Because we so much depend on it. So we also, at the same time, when we practice this, we reflect like this, we also see that we're not separate from our environment. We're not separate from the people that we care about. So that is when our compassion can also grow through that understanding. So we just very briefly will touch a little bit on the five mindfulness trainings and you can read more about them also in the pamphlet. But it's like a, a couple of, of aspects that can help us reflect on, on our life. And the second one is, uh, is true happiness. One aspect is refraining from stealing and taking what belongs to others. Uh, it also contains how can we be generous with our time, energy, and resources to share with those who are in need. So it's coming back to seeing the suffering that we're aware of in our lives and in the lives of the world, and wanting to cultivate more happiness, peace, and harmony. So it's kind of a way for us to live our lives, but also engaging in society in a way that will bring more harmony and peace into the world. I think we can all see the suffering that is created when some people just don't have anything. And it's at the expense of some having a lot. So we see there's suffering there. And we also know that greed is suffering. So we don't judge, but we can understand the situation of those who have more way they can use properly and those who doesn't have food to eat. So it helps us to generate that sense of we want to share the things we have, but also as a collective. We don't just want to hold on to what we can get our hands on, but we want to live our lives in a way that we can share. And that generosity also benefits ourselves first. Uh, all right. And the third mindfulness training is, uh, title is True Love. And it's helping us to relate to our sexuality and our sexual desire and how to engage in relationship with real love and uh, respect and helping us recognize that sexual desire is not love and coming back to learn to look at the other person not as an object for our desire but as a human being with all the aspirations 
with all the feelings and background, with parents and ancestry, just like we do. So we want to understand that person. We want to understand them so that we can support them to live a happy and fulfilling life. But also in our society, we can, again, coming back to the suffering in our own lives or maybe in the lives of others, we can see that our sexual activity create a lot of suffering. When we're not able to control or be the master of our sexual energy, which is a natural energy, so we don't want to suppress it. Also as monastics, we don't want to have a vow of chastity, but we know that sexual energy is in us, so how can we use it in a way that will bring life into the world through our thinking, our speaking, and our actions. And when we recognize also the the suffering on a bigger scale, we realize that my life is not separate from everyone else's life. So how can I contribute to a, maybe a more healthy way of looking at sexuality, a more healthy way of looking at a relationship? What does it mean to be in a relationship based on love, on respect? So these are all great vast areas we can focus our whole practice and life on, on these trainings and to understand them better. The fourth training is about deep listening and loving speech. Coming back to our actions of, of speaking, of words, and but also our listening. If we can be present for people, can we just listen to the person in our life and how their day was? And just feeling them, not just listening to them, but feeling them, feeling their experience. Or are we so fast in wanting to come up with what we've done or a solution maybe to a problem they're going through or a difficulty, we want to fix it. So deep listening and loving speech gives us a chance to, to create a more deep communication with people in our lives and also with ourselves, learning to listen to ourselves. So when we come back to our breathing, we're just listening to our breathing. When we come back to our body and being aware of how our body feels, not to fix it, not to change it, but just like our brother was sharing in the, the video, when he come back to his breathing, and feeling the rising and falling, he can already be more settled. So that's the kind of act of deep listening. We're able to relax, and a lot of things can settle and transform right there. Mm -hmm. And in our speaking, it's not just that we don't want to say lies, we don't want to exaggerate and make up stories or spread rumors, but we also want to share in a way that will encourage the other person, that will help the other person seeing that we really care for them. Helping the other person feel that we're recognizing all their good qualities. So that's four mindfulness trainings. The fifth mindfulness training is on nourishment and healing. So one aspect is trying to refrain in our life from ingesting toxins, and chemicals that will create unease or confusion in our minds, but also that will put an unnecessary burden on our body. So we are aware that our body, our organs, they function day by day, day by day, night after night. So recognizing this, we can see how can we eat, how can we drink, how can we ingest things that will help our body to be healthy and well, so that we can feel well and relaxed in our body? Energetic and strong, but also relaxed and at ease. And this is very interesting, like what we take in, what we consume also through our senses, what we listen to, what we read about, and what is the consequences, like we're talking, what, what are those actions leading to? How much news can we take in before it becomes a toxin that feeds our depression, our despair, our confusion? So it's not just about heavy drugs we're talking, but also things on the website that is creating a sense of always lacking. We should just have something more. We're watering our, our seed, our tendency to crave things that we don't have yet or the violence in us through looking at violent things. So those are some other things I'd like to share about the fine mindfulness trainings. And, uh, remembering that they're like a, a, a invitation
to go on a path. Like uh, the North Star, showing the way to the North. We don't think we can get there, but we go in the direction of the North. And in the same way in our practice, we don't try too hard when we practice mindfulness of breathing. We're just following and being aware of our natural breath. So in the practice of mindfulness, don't try too hard. We'll seal up the energy of life through us, and we, we won't be very successful. So thank you for listening. Dear friends, my name is Numai, and I'm from Austin, Texas. And before I start sharing, can we sing a song together? It's a very simple song. It only has one line, and it's the line is, Open my heart. So it goes, Open my heart, open my heart, open my heart, open my heart. Let's we'll sing it again. the reasons why I came to the mindfulness practice was because I wanted to open my heart and a lot of times um, we come to the practice because of some kind of trauma or really deep strong emotions and suffering that brings us to the practice. Um, but for me, I, I didn't really suffer any trauma. I was, I'm very thankful that I had a very happy childhood. My parents were very loving and I felt safe. And um, I had a I, had, I was pretty happy, but I felt like that happiness was, uh, was superficial, that I was missing something, that there was this like underlying um, dissatisfaction that there's more to life than what I'm doing right now. Because before I came to the practice, um, I was in school. I was one of 
those students that make straight A's, 4.0 GPAs, and there was just this like running and running and running and running to do something, to make something out of my life, to have meaning, because I thought I had to be somebody really important. I thought I had to do something really grand. I thought I had to make a splash and stand out. And that's how I have meaning in my life. But it wasn't enough for me. Like, the happiness that I got from my friends, the happiness that I got from my passing test scores, the happiness that I got from all the material things that I had, it wasn't enough for me. And what's really funny is that like throughout this whole time, my life was was a blur. It's sort of like when you're watching TV, nowadays you have high definition TV, but you know, just a couple of years back, you know, the screen is a little fuzzy. And when you're watching the TV, you're sort of removed from what's happening. You know, you can see it's happening, but you're like in a different space. And you can't really feel, like I couldn't feel, you know, when you watch TV, what's going on. And that was what it was like when I was watching my life. I could see my life just passing by. And I couldn't really connect or feel what was going on. And I think that my greatest fears in life isn't dying. Like, you know, some of us are afraid, oh, I don't want to die. Um, <laughs> one of my greatest fears is dying, but not living my life and not finding meaning in it. So when I was seeing my life pass by on a TV screen, but I wasn't really feeling what was going on. That was one of the greatest sufferings that I had. I couldn't really taste, I couldn't like really savor, I couldn't smell or see or feel what was going on. I couldn't um, see my parents when they're in front of me. I couldn't see their happiness. And I couldn't see that they were there. But the practice, when I encountered the practice, it, it changed my life because I could really feel that I'm here. I'm here, New My Win is here in Corvallis, in the public library, on stage, sitting cross-legged on this cushion, and um, I'm here. stop my, my mind by following my breathing and be aware of my body and things that are around me, then I'm tasting my life. I'm finding meaning in my life right now because I'm here. And so that's what Knowing that I'm here was what brought happiness to me, and that's what the practice, the mindfulness practice, helps. It helps me following my breathing, doing sitting meditation, doing walking. It always helps me bring myself back and reminds me I am here, and I am very happy. 
one of the other things that I like to practice is um, knowing that other people are here and that it's a miracle and I'm happy. So, Joanna, I know you're here. I'm looking into your eyes. I know you're here. And I'm very happy. Because it's a miracle that we're both here together. And I can, um, when I go home and visit my parents in Texas, I can look into the eyes of my mother and I can just look at her and I can say, Mom, I know you're here and I'm very happy. Uh, these beautiful flowers, I know that you are here and I'm very happy. So um, I'd like to invite us just to maybe turn to the person next to us and look into their eyes and just silently say, dear friend next to me, go ahead, you can, you can turn. <laughs> dear friend, I know you are here and I'm very happy. And you can say that to the other person. And that's one of, that's what has brought meaning to my life, is knowing that I am here, and knowing that this other, everything else is here. And just feeling the miracle of that just slowly opens my heart more and more. And so that is all I'd like to share. My dear friends of Corvallis, I know that you are here and I'm very happy. Dear friends, thank you all for coming out today. Um, so I'm going to speak a little bit on strong emotions. Uh, and we've been touring around together for a little while, this group. You always got to kind of wonder why they give you certain tasks, like why I was chosen to pick on strong emotions, especially because they know me pretty well. <laughs> what are they trying to say? But, uh, I used to be a, a really angry person for sure, really angry. I was angry about a lot of things, um, how the government worked, uh, how things wouldn't change, uh, some of the, the inequalities in, in the world, and just kind of things in general. It's kind of, a, kind of an angry person. And uh, I practiced with that for a while. And one thing that really changed that for me uh, was realizing that it wasn't the outside conditions that were causing me to be angry. Um, and I think that's a really important thing that one recognizes uh, when you start practicing, is, it, is realizing that, no, it, it's not actually them. I'm angry, and I'm choosing something to be angry about. I'm choosing to be angry, so I have anger. It's happening, and I don't want to take responsibility for it, so I'm choosing something else. Being like, that's why I'm angry. It's nothing to do with me. And uh, through the practice of, of meditation, I've seen that it's not, I used to think it was like maybe 50 50. Okay, it's like that person's a bit of a jerk, and that's why I'm angry. But it's still my anger, so I'll take that. But as I, as I practice more and more, I realize it's 100% me. It's just anger, there's anger within. Um, and things touch it, things bring it up, um, but it's my responsibility. And that's how I look at uh, strong emotions in general. Um, 
So when, when anger arises in me, I look at it and I realize, okay, this is my anger. This is nothing to do with that person. Um, because you, two things might happen. The same thing might happen to two different people and they'll react very differently to them. Or there's certain people that trigger you that won't trigger someone else. And so looking at that, you can see, okay, this is really me. And at the beginning, when I started practicing, something would trigger my anger and I'd be angry for like a couple of hours about something. You know, someone cuts me off in traffic, but like two hours of anger about that. And uh, through practice, I can see that shifting, where instead of like two hours of anger, I'd be angry for like an hour and 45 minutes. I was like, wow, that's awesome. That's like 15 minutes I saved, you know, of like not being angry. And that's, that's a lot of what it is. So anger, strong emotions are seeds. In, in Buddhist psychology, we look at things as, like our field's a bit like a, like a, our mind's a bit like a field. And so certain seeds get planted and we water those seeds. And that's why people stay angry for so long. True emotions last like three or four seconds. Like, being angry is natural. You're never gonna not stop being angry. But it's like a three or four second thing. If you're angry for more than three or four seconds, you're watering that. You're causing that. And it's, it's how, we, how we treat our mind. We just don't understand how our mind works. So we keep watering that anger. We like relive the moment again, over and over again, just to uh, continue that. And it becomes a, a habit. So, you know, some person gets angry. Maybe they just get angry for three or four seconds. Someone else gets angry for 20 minutes. Someone like me gets angry for two hours. Or used to, I don't really do that anymore. But that's, that's all about how much you watered that seed in the past. And so through the practice, you can look at that and be like, okay, I, I don't want to water this seed anymore. And, and over time, it will diminish. And you'll get down to the point where you're only angry for three or four seconds. Someone cuts you off in traffic, there's like a protective like, ooh, like that wasn't pleasant, three or four seconds and then done, you know? You're on to your next stop. And it works similarly with different emotions, not just anger. You can look at um, like greed, craving, those sorts of things. We Commercials are great at watering that seed in us and really making us desire certain things watering our consciousness. Uh, Fapo was talking about how uh, sense impressions really water us and cause us to, uh, uh, to go into that. And I do, I do it a lot. And monastery is great, because you get to see your mind, because everything's so quiet, and people are generally pretty nice. So you know if anything came up, it's probably you. <laughs> Which on the outside, you know, it's sometimes it's a little bit harder to like see that, but in the monastery it's very clear. And, and also, like, with craving, you know, you live in a monastery and there are beautiful women who come up, you know? And, and you'll, at least me, I'll, like, fall in love with someone, just, like, absolutely fall in love with them, you know? And I'll see someone else, also very beautiful, and I'll completely forget about the first person and just totally, totally, like, into the other person. It's so funny, like, how your mind works, or at least how my mind works. And so, over time, you get to really see that and get to know your mind and how it functions. And, and you learn some compassion for your mind and, and how you are and kind of how you're hardwired. Um, we have lots of seeds. Some of them get passed down from our ancestors and then some of them we water. So dealing with strong emotions is like being a good gardener. Not only do you try not to water the difficult seeds, the seeds that, like the anger, the craving, all those seeds, um, but you also can nourish your, your positive seeds to really uh, help you be equanimous. So we go back to anger. Not only can you stop watering that seed, you can also build equanimity, like keeping your mind balanced in situations. It's like the antidote to the poison of anger, where, because um, a lot of times, we're not really addicted to things or emotions we're addicted to the sensation that they cause in our body. That's what we really enjoy, is the sensation, pleasant sensations, 
or we try to avoid unpleasant sensations. So if someone says something bad to us, causes unpleasant sensations in the body, like they insult us. And we don't like that. So we get angry. And it, we're not really angry at that person, we just don't like the sensation that it caused. So keeping your mind balanced when you feel unpleasant sensations, to not have your, balance, not have your mind go completely uh, off kilter. So you can build that through practice. Just steadling your mind. Okay, someone insulted me. I don't like that. It's, it's unpleasant, but I'm not going to react. I'm going to uh, keep my mind balanced. And the same thing, like you see someone who's very beautiful, very attractive, that, and they create very pleasant sens sensations in your body. You're like, I want more of that. You know, I want to meet this person. I want to talk to them. Da, 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 da. And you can do the same thing. You can um, build... Uh, Sort of this equanimous, equanimous mind, <laughs> equanimous mind, where, where you can uh, stay balanced with that. You can enjoy the pleasant sensations. It's not like we're saying don't enjoy pleasant sensations. Like pleasant sensations are great. Just don't run after them. Don't don't like, you know, like when they're not there. Don't wish they were. That's 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 the difficulty. That's the suffering. And then there's also a lot of time where you'll have neutral sensations, where you feel a bit bored. You know, monastery life is sometimes slow. You know? So you just, you're bored and um, you look at that and uh, that, that actually is a great time because your mind is, has freedom. It has, it's not overwhelmed by the senses or different things. So it gives you time to look deeply into things. Like, eh, not much is going on. Like Nimai was saying, you can really contemplate a flower and just fall in love with it. Really open your heart and go deep into, deep in, and, and nourish that joy and that happiness within you. And those, by nourishing those positive seeds, it's the same thing. So when you're nourishing the negative seeds, you're, you know, you're going to be angry. You're, you're going to, like, run after things. You're not going to be stable. You're not going to be solid. If you nourish those positive seeds, the happiness, the joy, the uh, enjoyment, you're gonna have those like, all the time. You meet people who are happy, like they're literally happy people. That's because they've watered that seed. It's not any miracle or like any, that they have something special that the rest of us don't. They've just put energy into cultivating that. And over time, if you cultivate that, like if you don't cultivate your joy very much, you might see something beautiful and be joyful for like a few seconds wow, that's awesome, and then you go right back to where you were. But you can cultivate that, where you, instead of being like happy and joyful for a couple seconds, it's like a couple minutes, where you're just like, oh, I blissed out. Just like, wow, this is so cool. And that can extend more and more time. Same thing with being angry, you know? So you can choose the quality of your mind um, with awareness. If you're in the present moment, if you're really stable, solid, aware, you can water whatever seed you want. You can create uh, your own field. You can grow your own fruit. And um, so, so not only just dealing with those negative emotions, but also like creating happiness, creating awareness, creating joy, creating love, just opening your heart to things, really um, connecting in, in such a positive way. And people really respond to that. You can open your heart and just be yourself with people. It's amazing the shifts you'll see, how, uh, how people will respond and, and how your life shifts. And for me, that's been the, uh, the trajectory of my practice, is going from a place where you know, I'm, I'm angry most of the time and blaming other people for it, to a place where I can really open my heart up and really just connect with people and be myself without, um, you know, having, having to worry about things very much. It's, uh, it's a beautiful path to be on. And it's, it's something we can all do. It's not, uh, it's not uh, something that's very, that you have to be in a monastery for. Very, like, fun. Okay, homework. 
find something that you really enjoy. I'm also a Chinese medical doctor, and like nourishing joy is really good for building up your reserves. Like you'll live longer. So find something you really enjoy doing. Like really enjoy and do it. Give yourself permission and find food you really like. Like even if it's maybe not okay, you should be pretty healthy in general, but <laughs> but even if it's not like super healthy, if it's like something that you had as a kid or something that you grew up with, oh your body will love it. Like it it's I think it's worth it just to have that, to create that joy, to find things that, that really nourish you and that can yeah, like that's what that's what we should search for. So so homework at least next week, two things you enjoy doing. Okay, you have to write a low report and everything, but uh, two things you really enjoy doing and just go out and do it. Like set set time aside, go out, um, really nourish that thing, and yeah, have an, and enjoy watching your mind. If if you can do that, don't take it too seriously because if you take it too seriously and get frustrated, it's no, you're not watering the right seeds. So just uh, take it easy, enjoy your mind. It's crazy, you know, when you start watching it, you see how crazy you really are. Um, but it's okay, it'll be okay.